One. So around nine or ten years ago, I was living with my mum, dad, and older sister in an oldish house in a very small village. Like when I say small, I mean its only main feature was a small church, and a few scattered houses occupied mostly by very old people. At the time, it was the summer, so I wasn't at school or anything, and since we were so far in the middle of nowhere, I spent most of that time at home glued to one screen or another. The usual routine was I'd wake up around 10 or 11. By this point, mum, dad, and sister had all left for work, so I had the house to myself. I'd go downstairs, make some toast, watch some random stuff on TV for an hour, before heading back to my room to continue with whatever game I was grinding through that particular day. The usual habits of a 17-year-old guy cut off from the world by many, many fields. I should give a quick rundown of our house. It was an older cottage with two rooms upstairs, mine and my sister's, and everything else downstairs. As you walk up the stairs, you got a very small landing and could go either left to my room, or immediate right, my sister's room. Basically, the way this was laid out was that I could sit in my room with the door open and my sister's room is directly opposite. I should also mention that the ceilings in both our bedrooms were slanted. We were basically in a large attic where the roof slanted down. Because of where the slant met the wall, we had crawl space that ran through the length of the house on either side of the rooms, both with a small door to access them. These were mostly used for storing normal attic stuff like Christmas decorations and old forgotten toys. The doors to these were thin little things, about four feet tall with a small handle on the outside. This is important because turning these tiny doorknobs opened them, but only from the outside. If the door was pushed shut with you inside, there was no way back out. I discovered this myself on more than one occasion. The door on my side ran along my room and along one wall in my sister's room, and hers ran along the other side along my room. This space was not very big. You had to crouch to stand in it, and most of the time you were in there. You were crawling on hands and knees. This is all important, I promise. Anyway, this one morning I'm awoken to a familiar noise. Some sort of small creature rustling around in the crawl space on my sister's side. I could hear this because my bed was against a wall that ran along it. Not an unusual noise, living in the countryside. We had mice almost constantly, and pretty much had the run of the storage spaces. No matter how many traps were put down. I thought nothing of it and got up, and went off to begin my morning ritual of toast and television. The first odd thing I noticed while watching TV, I could hear movement upstairs. My sister's room was directly above the living room, so I assumed she'd just not gone to work that day for whatever reason, and continued munching. Around an hour or two later, I went back upstairs and booted my PC. As I was waiting, I turned around to my open door and faced my sister's closed one, and realized it was late in the day and she had yet to leave her room, an odd thing, since she normally parked up on the sofa in the living room on her days off, and didn't move until our parents returned. We're not the most active family. I started to think that maybe she was at work, and I'd imagined the noise from upstairs. But as I mused this, I noticed the crack of light at the bottom of her door as a shadow passed by it. Okay, so there's definitely someone in there, so it must be her, right? I once again pushed it from my mind and went back to my PC. More time passed, and the thought came back to me. Why would she be at home but not leave? She only has a small TV in her room and no books, so what has she been doing in there all day? I glanced back around and, again, saw a shadow under the door. She was still moving around in there, so what was up? I finally decided to go knock on her door. I knocked a few times and said her name. No answer. Weird, but maybe she had headphones on or something. I knocked a bit harder again and said her name again, but louder. No answer. Alright, I thought, fuck this. I'm just going to go in, so I cracked the door open and peered around. I found an empty room. No one inside at all. Feeling slightly confused, but better that it was just my imagination, I stepped in properly and looked around, and saw something that made me full-on panic. Near the bottom of her little door, leading to the crawl space, there was a small hole that the mice had made to get in and out of the bottom. Really small, but just big enough to fit half your hand through. 
there coming through that door were four fingers holding the door shut from the inside. At first I thought, no, it can't be fingers, don't be stupid. Until I watched them slowly creep back through the hole into the crawl space. I lost my shit. Very quietly, though, I might add. I backed out of the room, shutting the door behind me, and ran to my room. Being the stupid teenager I was, I grabbed what might be the most imposing weapon I could find. The fake Winchester rifle cap gun I got from Disneyland a few years previous. I figured that if whoever was hiding in that bedroom didn't believe it was a real firearm, I could at least hit them with it. I ran off downstairs to where my dogs were on the far side of the house, and called my mum, who worked about a five minute drive from our house. She told me to stay put, and that her and her manager were on their way. In this time, I made a small upgrade from fake plastic rifle to one of my dad's golf clubs. I felt much better with that. Finally, my mum and her boss, John, turn up, and I tell them everything leading up to this point. They say okay, and we all set off upstairs to investigate. Me, rather unheroically, bringing up the rear with my golf club. We get into my sister's room, and I point to the door. I'll never know if my mum is just hard as nails or massively stupid, but while John and I watch, she marches over to the door, yanks it open, and sticks her head in. A moment passes while she looks left and right, and John and I are preparing to yank her back from the clutches of the psycho hobo murderer hiding in there, before she shouts, Chris, what the fuck are you doing in there? Get out! Small amount of backstory, Chris was my sister's boyfriend. Unbeknownst to me, the night before, my dad had asked Chris to leave as he had stayed with us for around five days at this point. He said, yep, that's cool, and as far as mum and dad knew, he'd headed home. What really happened was instead of leaving, him and my sister had planned to make it seem like he'd left, and he could stay another night. He then would wake up before my mum shouted up my sister for work like she did every morning, and would hide in the crawl space and sleep there until everyone had left for the day. The one small hitch in the plan that they did not think of was, you guessed it, me. They had forgotten I was home and conveniently sat directly opposite the only exit for most of the day, so he was trapped. When I knocked, he hid himself behind the door and held it shut to prevent being locked in. Anyway, my mum swiftly told him to get the fuck out and not come back. Sadly, this was not the last time we saw the guy, as it turned out he'd stolen quite a bit of money from my sister's room while he had been hiding out, and then, because my sister makes terrible decisions, got her pregnant and proceeded to smash windows trying to get at her and the baby around a year later. For a while, we lived in the same city when I went to uni and he was spending time at the prison there, for stabbing someone in a completely different town. Super guy. Oh, and small topper to all this? As I mentioned earlier, the only rooms upstairs are mine and my sister's bedrooms. He'd been in there for close to 14 hours with no access to a toilet. But no worry for this guy, because he had lots of empty bottles to piss in. Which he kindly left behind for us to clean up. And finally, around a year later, his mum was getting the Christmas decorations out, which were at the far back of the storage space. She found a small bag filled with feces. I should mention where she found it is exactly next to where my bed is on the other side of the wall. The rustling that woke me up that day, it was him, hiding his shit amongst our tinsel and tree. Two. For years, I trained as a track and field athlete. Primarily, I was a pole vaulter. That seemingly simple but highly specialized skill helped me become the first in my family to go to college and opened up whole new worlds. As a result, I have a passion for helping other kids with similar backgrounds access opportunities through track and field. So as soon as my work schedule afforded me the time, I started assistant coaching a team at a community center. It had always been my favorite part of the week until Cooper, a new coach, showed up. He had pretty impressive stats and all the local celebrities knew who he was and said we were lucky to have him. I'd moved to this town for work, so didn't know the scene like I did back home. But apparently he'd been some big deal in high school, and had to turn down college offers due to some kind of resistance to moving out of state. 
he didn't get any offers from in-state schools. All the kids thought Cooper was the hottest thing since sliced bread for the same reasons I thought he was a bit of a loser. He was living off of his parents without a lucrative job at 30 plus, dyed his unwashed hair neon colors, drove a motorcycle, and watched all the same cartoons the team did. We coached 6 to 10 year olds. From the moment I first laid eyes on Cooper, I did not like him. There is almost no one I don't like. Usually, at most, people have qualities I don't like, but I still like them overall. This guy didn't even have qualities I liked. I tried not to let it show, though, because he'd never actually done anything to make me not like him. It was just a feeling. I don't think he liked me either, though. Because when it was just the two of us alone, he would never speak to me. I would come in to start the day's practice and say, Hi, Cooper, how's your week so far? And he just nodded me in silence. He'd been a really successful sprinter, and I was looking for new speed drills to run with the kids. So I head to the coach and asked Cooper to train me in facilitating the drills. He said it was no problem and was totally affable and excited about it in the presence of the group of staff. The second we were alone, just the two of us, he was stone-faced and silent, leaving me to figure it out for myself as though the conversation had never happened. I'll clarify. I said he was a new coach. He wasn't entirely new. He'd been there for six or seven years before I'd been there. But he'd taken a long break in the middle, and when he returned he'd had an opposite practice schedule to me, so I had never had to deal with him. At first I had actually leaned into that uneasy feeling he gave me initially, and deliberately scheduled my practices counter to his. As a result we were assigned athletes with unrelated areas of expertise, so were eventually booked to different days organically. Then there were some funding cuts and fewer practice days, so it came to a point that I spent three to five hours a week alone with Cooper, setting up and breaking down practices. It was at that point that I expressed my uneasiness to the head coach. Apparently, Cooper was always a bit off, but he told everyone he had autism so not to be put out by any stilted things he said or seemingly inappropriate ways he conducted himself. People bought it. And I did too, at first. My sister is autistic. I know it can make a person unpredictable and seem irrational or unpleasant when they're actually just being misunderstood. But then the weather changed. It got cold, and we were pushed indoors. So instead of Cooper off on a distant field and myself on another, we were sharing a single gymnasium. This was the first time I saw how he ran his practices. There was just something about how he interacted with the kids that made my skin crawl. He was distinctly childlike. Not in a good way. In a way that crossed a boundary and disrupted the power dynamic of coach and athlete, and crossed over into peer-to-peer -peer territory. As a 30-something-year-old guy, he was trying too hard to be friends with 6- to 10-year-olds but it was tempered with an extreme level of control and discipline exerted over his group that again violated boundaries in another direction, going beyond meticulous coaching and entering into abusive territory. His seven-year-old runner wouldn't make the mile goal they'd set for the week, and he'd be shouting at the top of his lungs berating the kid. He had this Jekyll and Hyde personality, where he'd go from overly saccharine, best-of-friend-childlike wonderment demeanor to Full Metal Jacket wartime drill sergeant in a split second. He also played clear favorites. He spent significantly more time perfecting and assisting a select few athletes and blatantly ignore others. A boy among his favorites, Jordan, developed an interest in pole vaulting, so switched over to my practices. When Cooper found out, he flew into a rage, Jordan was a sweet, nerdy little kid with big goggles and a soft voice. Not someone who takes being blown up at or about well. In front of half my team, Cooper was screaming things like, You forced him, didn't you? You manipulated him into changing practices because you want the credit for all the best prospects. You know I developed Jordan from day one, and he's mine, and we have a connection you could never understand. He'll never see his full potential with you. And on, and on. 
Meanwhile, I'm thinking, bro, chill, he's eight and wants to try a variety of activities in his after-school sport. That's why he's here. What the fuck? That incident was kind of the tipping point in my concerns about him. The favoritism had been eating away at me for some time, because it not only raised some personal red flags, but I could see it eroding the confidence of those athletes who weren't the favorites. Who he favored did not even directly correspond to athletic capability. Jordan was a middling athlete in terms of stats or build or things like that, and we had to remember we were dealing with recreational young kids, not Olympic hopefuls. So I brought these concerns to the head coach, who was present in our end of program less and less to be off in another facility, working with the high schoolers. And his response was basically, People love sausage, but they don't always like how it's made. Cooper's team sees great results. They're sticking with the sport and they're moving into our advanced program. They'll probably almost all get private high school offers or local varsity opportunities. Every other coach in our staff finds him quite enjoyable to work with and has learned a good deal from him, etc., etc., etc. He wasn't really trying to hear me. So I focused on making my aspect of the program as strong as I could be in hopes it would attract a lot of athletes and afford me a position of power to box Cooper out and minimize his involvement with the athletes. Then the gender segregation thing started. I showed up to practice a bit late one day due to a traffic ticket I had to contest. I let Cooper know I would be late and begrudgingly asked him to start my practice for me. He said no problem. When I arrived, my previously co-ed team was only girls. All my boys had been moved over to his team and he'd given me all his girls. I had been working with some of my male athletes for three plus years and this switch from co-ed to gender segregated at ages 6 to 10, was unprecedented. I thought maybe it was for some specific activity that they would finish up then return to regular teams. Nope. Cooper let me know he'd made an executive decision to switch the rosters up. Even though he now had a bunch of pole vaulters and next to no vaulting experience, and kids with distance aspirations on his team that never did longer than an 800 meter run in their practices, it was completely illogical. I was furious to see the hard work I had put in with my athletes derailed this way, and called up the head coach once again. Even he said this was a weird move, and the young athletes were supposed to be in co-ed groups assigned during tryouts at the beginning of the season. All of a sudden, Cooper shed his supposed social anxiety and his self-proclaimed autism, enough to make a very convincing case about boys needing a masculine role model because of not having stable father figures in the home the presence of a lot of girls impeding the bonding process. And girls needing to learn to work together in a single-sex team because that's how high school and college squads would be configured, and social drama couldn't be getting in the way of their training. Great. Sexist and creepy all at once. I made it clear I was adamantly opposed to this and almost considered quitting. But I was again met with... You're the only coach who has a problem with Cooper. Everyone else likes him and thinks segregating the teams is a good idea. I then also worried what would happen if I quit and was replaced with someone who wasn't at all skeptical of Cooper, so didn't keep an eye on him. I shut my mouth and just hung back to observe, but I kept my eyes and ears open. It took one week for the new girls on my team to start talking about how they liked the feedback they got since making the switch because they got no real attention from Cooper, even some who had been with us for years. Which led to proclamations about how he only worked seriously with the boys, and how even among the boys he had clear favorites. They said when they'd raised concerns, or their parents had, they'd been told to excuse it as symptoms of his autism, and its senior staff had spoken to him about it. Hearing these red flags echoed from young athletes within his team just reaffirmed the uneasy feelings I'd been having ever since we'd met. Some of the girls had brothers in the track program, so I did all I could think of without losing my job and leaving Cooper unchecked, with no tangible proof to bring forward about him. I encouraged the girls to have their brothers complain about the favoritism, since they were still on his team. It worked. The rabbit sports parents hated the idea that some kids were getting more specialized training than others, and started asking why their daughters weren't getting to train with the elite coach anymore, and why their sons now felt some athletes got more of the coach's attention than others. 
Whatever answer he gave was apparently not sufficient because a lot of parents decided they wanted to start sitting in on practices. We had no rule against parents staying for practices. They just didn't usually do it because they were busy at work or with their other kids or just trusted us. But now parents were paying attention, worried less about their kids' athletic development and more so making sure everything was on the up and up within our program. We were in the real hardcore streets of this neighborhood. None of the parents had a problem pulling a seat right up front to observe. And in a legitimate youth program, no one should have a problem with them doing so. But Cooper wasn't a plan of this, and quickly concocted an excuse about young kids not needing parental pressure when trying to enjoy a fun sport. And, the audience is getting in the way of their training. He outlawed parents from viewing his practices. That's where the head coach drew a line in the sand, even for his golden child. He let Cooper know, in no uncertain terms, parents had every right to sit in on practices. They got into a real blowout over this with Cooper demanding, Why don't you trust me with the kids? I should get to run my practice my way. I don't need fat-ass parents looking over my shoulder, commenting on how I do my work. The kids aren't themselves around their parents, you wouldn't understand. Highly inappropriate and unusual remarks for anyone, let alone a seasoned professional. It was eventually settled that parents could sit in the bleacher section of the gymnasium. Visible, but not pressed up against the practice. So of course, the first day that this was set to be the arrangement... Cooper planned a loop around the outside of the facilities, even though it was barely 30 degrees Fahrenheit out. I was surprised. But for the first time in months, I didn't pay too much attention to his practice. Because I knew he had a room full of watching parents to answer to now. The parents were not motivated to get up and follow their children outside, because it was drizzling on and off, and they were just doing a few laps around the medium-sized building. It took me 7 minutes and 19 seconds to notice. I know because I had just started timing my own team on a series when Cooper's team went out the door. Cooper took his team bag when the team left to jog these laps. There's no reason he should have been taking a bag with him for running anywhere. No reason his personal effects should need to leave the gym and be going outside with the team if they were coming right back. I instructed my kids to go line up against a wall made sure the row full of parents had an eye on them, and knew that no one was to move, and I dashed outside. I saw the kids running, but Cooper wasn't anywhere to be found. I knew something was amiss, but wasn't sure what. I started counting the kids. He was too short. Did everyone come in today? Is everyone from your team here today? Did they show up? I choked out to the older kids. Uh, no, someone called out. Thinking about, oh, okay, who, how many? Lucius is grounded from sports, someone else called back. Well, that was one. We were missing two. Anyone else not here today? No, nope, uh-uh, the team affirmed. I could feel the blood draining down to my toes. Who was missing? Who was missing? Who was missing? What do I do? Then I realized, as the panic shook off and adrenaline set in, spurring me to action, the more obvious question is, where was Cooper? I asked the team where he went, and it answered two questions at once. The younger kid explained, Coach Cooper took Jordan to go somewhere in his car. All right, I was thinking to myself, 911. 911, I need to call 911, that's what I need to do. I started frantically patting my pockets, but quickly remembered I was at work and my phone was in my locker. My vocal cords constricted from the rush of fear hitting my nervous system but I managed to flag an elderly couple down in the far end of the parking lot, yelling, Phone! Cell phone! Hello! Do you have a cell phone? I guess I was too far away for them to hear me, because the wife called back, You're looking for what? And the husband turned to her and denunciated, A phone! A mobile telephone! Before I could command my legs to reach her, she said, Oh, oh, I haven't seen it, sorry and slid into her driver's seat and started to pull out. My body finally caught up to my mind just as they were beginning to back their car out, and I threw myself against the side. Maybe not the safest thing to do, but there was an emergency at hand. I started pounding on the driver's side window, yelling, No! Your phone! I need your phone! 
The poor old people thought I was trying to rob them. I was blocking their car at this point, demanding their cell phone. So the older woman turned to her husband and cried, Oh, George, call the police. I realized that was a much more sensible request, so I went, Yes, yes, please call the police. Call the police. 911. I was scrambling to wrap my head around the situation. It had actually only been about a single minute since I had been informed Cooper took Jordan away in a car. I waited to be sure the police were being called, and then I realized my second biggest problem. I had a huge group of unsupervised kids outside in a parking lot. I screamed back to them to get against a wall in their numbers. It was an ordered grouping we used when moving from one field to another, or when dismissing them from practice to their parents for easy hat cuts. They knew when they got in their numbers not to move and not to screw around. I think they saw how keyed up I was, and it froze them into silence. They just waited to see what I did next, evolutionary instinct telling them danger was present. The older couple had 911 on the line, and they were telling the operator that they weren't sure what was going on. That they were leaving the gym and chaos broke out in the parking lot. I started crying out, He took a kid! He took him in his car! Jordan Perez! Jordan Perez! His mom, Yasina Perez, works at the processing plant on Elm. She's there now! Someone go get her and tell her what happened! Oh my god, please hurry! Please send the police! Please hurry! He took him! He took him in his car! God, he took him in his car! The elderly couple gave the operator some information. I was asked some questions, but I don't remember answering them anymore. I probably wasn't much help. By this point, a few parents had come out to see what was taking so long for both coaches to be gone leaving a whole team unsupervised inside. And it unfolded from there. They immediately began a search for his car. For guys with his distinct green hair. For Jordan, for his mom at work. The parents could not believe that in the split second they watched their sons jog out the door, they had entered a crime scene and witnessed a kidnapping. Jordan's mother was pulled off the line from work, and she was hysterical, just completely beside herself. She didn't have much English fluency, so it was even harder for her to hear the detective say every gut-wrenching thing, and then wait 30 seconds for her to process it as she waited for the translator to say it. Let me tell you right now. Adam Mother hearing, at this time we believe your son has been abducted by this individual, to the list of things you never want to see firsthand. As detectives spoke to athletes, we learned Cooper would often talk about feeling like just a big kid, and complain to his team about the rules society imposes on him, and suggest it would be great if they could just live by the beach without anyone telling them what to do. Apparently this whole kid trapped in a child's body thing had become a major fixation for him, and was the analogy he'd used to explain a lot of his development delays and idiosyncrasies that by all later accounts really were just a form of autism. But being with his team was the only time he felt completely at peace and one of the guys, so to speak. He didn't really fit in with the girls, so eventually he just tried to organize them out of his life. I didn't know this next part at the time, but in the following weeks, I'd hear from various people involved until I'd pieced together the whole story. Cooper had continued trying to organize those he didn't fit in with, or who disapproved of his lifestyle out of his life, until eventually, he'd formulated a plan that involved he and his favorites on the team going off and starting a new life together. He had this very childlike short-term view of the plan that did not factor adult responsibilities, or real-world consequences into the aftermath, and basically envisioned hiding out in his parents' beach cottage with his ten-year-old friends for the rest of his life. He began cautiously introducing the idea of leaving regular life behind, and starting out without rules, without school, without parents, and living some radical freewheeling existence by the sea. It turns out some kids like their lives just fine, but others bought into this escapist fantasy. He then whittled down his favorites to even smaller numbers. Apparently Cooper wasn't so involved with his parents, because he was a deadbeat, but because their oversight was necessary in helping them organize a functional life. They offered him financial support if he took steps to maintain a job and participate actively in society, rather than isolating himself in his apartment playing video games. 
The breaking point apparently came when Cooper's parents found out he hadn't been adhering to some financial agreement they'd set, in which he allocated a certain portion of his paycheck to his own groceries, utilities, and other expenses. He told them he was making significantly less than he was at his day job. Coaching was a second job for all of us. And using the money on luxury items while his parents, who had their own financial struggles, were footing the bill for his necessities, thinking he made less than he did. Apparently on this day they confronted him about it, and he flew into a rage, saying he'd never come back. But it was an empty threat he'd made a dozen times before, and they thought nothing of it figuring he'd cool off, and they'd talk about it then. But instead, he decided it was the day he put his master plan in place, and escape all this tyranny he'd fallen victim to. He didn't have zero foresight into his plan of his, but not much. I got most of this explanation second and third hand, but apparently, his scheme to evade detection if anyone came to use the beach house was just to take his friends and camp on the beach until the cars had gone. The good news is he wasn't a pervert or anything. He really just wanted to hang out with his new friends at his beach house without anyone telling him what to do, and thought he was liberating them from their complaints of unfair parents who'd make them go to school and do chores. A few kids had tried to tell their parents what Cooper had suggested, but they wrote it off as their kids exaggerating or just outright lying. Because, of course, no 30-year-old adult who holds down a job would suggest a third grader never do homework again by running away, right? Well, the more the kids began to understand Cooper's childlike whimsy had a dark side, the less they wanted to hang out with him. Remember that dark side of controlling rage I'd mentioned? They'd begun to see it more and more when Cooper eliminated the girls from the team but found it still wasn't the friend's only wonderland of playhouse acceptance he had anticipated. He grew more and more paranoid that his athletes were conspiring against his plan for freedom. The day he abducted Jordan, Jordan was one of the only boys on the team still solidly in his corner. But Jordan didn't fully understand the plan. He thought this was going to be like a vacation. After driving for a bit, apparently he sensed Cooper was nervous so got scared himself. Jordan asked to call his mom. Cooper explained the whole point of this escape was so he would never have to see his mom again. Jordan, a young child, absolutely panicked at that statement, as anyone at that age probably would. Cooper had always been very rule-oriented and very plan-oriented. He hated when something didn't go as it was planned, or when a person didn't adhere to social mores as it had been previously explained to him. So this sent him into a rage, and he started melting down. Meanwhile, the police were with us at practice. No one was allowed in or out of the gym facilities. Everyone was questioned as to what they knew about Cooper, and what they might have seen today. None of that helped with the most pressing concern, getting Jordan back safely. As much of a total buffoon as the head coach turned out to be, to his credit, he did know to call Cooper's parents the minute he was appraised of the situation. Cooper's parents were stunned. You could tell from their expressions and the tones of their voices as they arrived that the whole thing was like some strange dream to them. It was surreal to me too, but not to the same degree. Every statement they made had the inflection of a question, as though they kept thinking they'd be corrected or told their son hadn't really committed the premeditated kidnapping of an elementary school child. At this time, they'd heard a few different versions of where Cooper was planning to spend the rest of his life. It turned out to be the family beach cottage. But some players just said he was going home. Most said the beach. A few others said Hawaii. And apparently one even said Buenos Aires. Because they had no way to definitely tell anything, they had to take each speculative claim from the kids seriously. What a nightmare. His parents quickly remembered, though, that even though Cooper had eventually ditched his phone, he was wearing a Fitbit-type watch that they'd purchased him one Christmas. They'd unlocked his GPS tracking, and the cops apprehended Cooper and Jordan before they'd even gone ahead and issued an Amber Alert. Of course, I wasn't there when they got him, but I've heard different versions of the story, that all seemed to agree on the following points. Jordan was terrified, but unharmed, and just wanted to see his mom. 
Cooper was irate, thinking Jordan had somehow called the police so felt betrayed by him, and went from seething anger to crushing sadness. Understandably, Noah can't recall any sympathy for him at the time of Jordan's recovery. Jordan's family almost moved ahead with charges, but ended up settling it before it moved ahead to trial, with some kind of agreement that a mark be put on Cooper's record, preventing him from working with kids again. And family's assurances, they were much more closely monitoring the situation now than they had before. I'm told his parents were nothing but apologetic throughout the entire process. And even though they were struggling themselves from having to support Cooper past the time they'd intended to retire on top of their own extraneous medical bills, they proactively volunteered a large out-of-court settlement that friends and family were going to help them pay. The friends and family probably did it to keep Cooper out of trial and away from prison, but his parents seemed genuinely horrified and sorry for what Cooper put that family through. The track and field program fell through pretty much right away after the incident, and it's a shame, because it was doing great things for the community. But I don't blame everyone for wanting nothing to do with us ever again. I couldn't go anywhere near the place it occurred, and I took a break from coaching. The whole thing was a big contributing factor to my beginning to look for opportunities to relocate back to my hometown. Even driving in the neighborhood of the place could make me physically sick. Eventually I found the right job in the right place, and after I got settled, I did start coaching again. But I remain hypersensitive about anyone who wants to make any last minute roster changes, or who plays favorites. And I never let anyone I'm coaching with take the kids out of other adults' line of sight. They think I overreact, and I couldn't care less. I just wish I'd adopted this attitude sooner. 3. I am male, and I work in the garden area of a home improvement store. I don't work the cash registers, and my manager doesn't even let me water the flowers, so a lot of the time I have nothing to do. This results in me taking extremely long bathroom breaks where I just scroll on my phone. I know it sounds bad, but it's better than standing around trying to look busy. Today was the same as any other with me wasting time in the bathroom. Nothing of interest happened until my work phone buzzed at the same time as the stall next to mine. A few seconds later I see that guy in the next stall had his hands stretched to the ground with his palm facing up. I at first thought he had run out of toilet paper and was asking for mine. He just stayed silent for a while so I ignored him after that. Then he started moving that hand uncomfortably close to my leg, so I immediately scooted away and prepared to leave. Once the man noticed that, he hurriedly got out of his stall before I could leave. Another few seconds of silence. I took a peek out from the gap of the stall door to see what the hell he was doing, and just like a scene from a horror movie, our eyes connected. He was barely an inch away from the door, trying to peek inside. My blood ran cold. If you're wondering why I didn't immediately open the door and cuss the guy out, I really hate confrontation. I avoid it whenever possible, and I do my best not to draw attention to myself. I stood sideways by the door so he wouldn't be able to see me. That's when the whispering started. I don't know what the first thing he said was, but it sounded like moaning. The next part was a bit more audible. He said something along the lines of wanting to see more of my unflushed toilet paper. I was thoroughly disgusted. This guy was a complete creep and I was alone in the bathroom with him. My heart was beating faster by the second. I knew I had to stay there until another person came into the bathroom. No way was I going to confront him alone. Probably a minute later someone finally arrives and I take this as my chance to wash my hands and get the hell out of there. Thankfully the presence of another person made the old man quit his creepy behavior. As I was about to leave, he blocked my path for a quick second before stepping aside. The weird thing was, I don't even think he works at the store, because he wasn't wearing any vest. My store is extremely lenient about uniform, but most workers at least wear a vest or something connected to the store. He just looked like a regular customer. I'm certain I heard phone dings echo in that bathroom. The phones have a signature ring to them, so it couldn't have been a coincidence. Either way, he only started creeping on me once the phone ring made it clear that I was an employee. The situation really creeped me out, and I've been totally unfocused on my work since then. 
I kept prowling the garden area to look out for any old man wearing a similar outfit to the creeper. I have an incredibly hard time distinguishing faces, so I probably wouldn't even recognize him even if I did see him. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 547. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. If you liked the video, then please do boop the like button and leave a comment, and share the video with your friends and family and your mortal enemies. By way of popping it up on the social medias, the Twitters, the Instagrams, what you can do on the Instagrams, um, and so on and so on. Alrighty, let's see. This is... Uh, to do Wednesday. Yeah, it's Wednesday, okay. No, it isn't. Right. Yes, it is. Okay. Sorry, I'm a bit discombobulated today. Um, Over-caffeinated yesterday, got to sleep late, and eh, don't do that. Right, so yeah, it is Wednesday, technically, when I'm recording this. Uh, i got a few errands to run today. I'll have to remember to do that. I have to pick up a prescription. Top up heating and power. I think that's about it, really. I'll probably stop in my local shop on the way home as well. <sighs> oh, and I've got a plumber coming to to investigate something tomorrow. Um, nasty smell coming from the, the drains. As hopefully I can get that sorted. Anyway, I'm going to head off from now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.